looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. So yes, when we work, we work for ourselves, but also for others. And if you look in Scripture, you're going to find that from the Old Testament law, Old Testament principles in Proverbs. You're going to find it even when the Apostle Paul spoke that he did this so he could then help others that couldn't do this. So it's not just like work, 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 mind, 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 all this money is just for me, me, me. It wasn't like that. On the other hand, it was not we work, you sit around, and we give you so you don't have to work. That's what it was really speaking here against, that kind of lifestyle. And that just doesn't work. The independent spirit has no desire to exist on handouts from government or even to siphon the living from the benevolence of friends. Now, when I look at the Great Depression, some of you might have lived during the Great Depression. That was probably America at its worst economically, and there were so many people that were out of work. My dad and mom lived during the Great Depression. And um, in many ways, I'm glad they did because there were so many values of what they learned during the Great Depression that they brought upon us as, as children growing up about working hard for your money, making sure you save, don't splurge your money, you know, enjoy what you have as basic needs of life. A little luxury may come now and then, but don't go after the luxuries. There's a lot that they taught us from that particular back uh, story. That being the case, here's what I do know about the Depression. America, when they were at their knees during the Depression time, they still joined heart-to-heart and hand-to-hand, and they rebuild the economy of our nation into the mightiest in the world, which then gave us the opportunity to do something for the rest of the world. Again, listen, while I might think America is a great country, we are only as great as we embrace God's Word here because God says, blessed is the country, the nation whose God is the Lord. I get that. So now what has happened to America? We have been blessed. And when we've been blessed, we become the richest country in the entire world. It wasn't because God favored us because He likes us more than others. It's because we follow biblical principles of when we work and we use our money wisely, which means we save it, we give it, we manage it, we use it, We use it to help others learn these truths. So all that being said, you look at America. What have we done? We have gone around the world and we have poured millions, trillions of dollars into other countries that were really hurting. Did we not? And we did that because of our work ethic to help them that had not at the time. Follow with me, if you will. We bombed Japan nuclear. We bombed Europe And after we did, and the war was over, we went back into the places that we demolished and we rebuilt those countries with many of the values that we had. And so when the world looks upon us in the past as that mighty country of America, they might want to know, where did that come from? I could say it could come from the men and the women who lived before us in our time, and they lived according to the biblical principles that if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, I know we need to take care of people, especially on our island, It grieves me to see anyone that's suffering. Yesterday, the canoe races were down in Waikiki, and one of our members here is a sweet lady, and she was racing in this, so we kind of went down. Didn't know she was there, ran into her, so glad we did. But while we were walking to where we were going to sit, there was a homeless person, best as we could tell, and he was laying on a bench right on Kalakaua, and while he was there, sound asleep, middle of the day, his arm was out laying on the pavement below, rolled out in front of him two feet with some bottle of pills somewhere. And I'm wondering, that poor man, I don't know what condition he was in. But I don't know, we can uh, take this situation and we can kick that can further down the road and we can make that can a better place for it to live in. But I'm going to tell you, the real problem is what can we do to help the can to really learn how to be a person that would be honoring God with a work ethic to those who can. And so there is some biblical answers to it. Are we just willing to pay the price to come alongside them to do it? Those of you who are guests and looking at our church, I want want you to look up here for a minute. I don't think there's any pastor who is more pleased, more blessed by the people in this church than I am. I know that there are families in this church that have teenagers right now. And these teenagers and most families would be out at the beach They'd be doing fun things, traveling all over the country when they could, playing, going to the movies, you know, cruising the mall because they're air-conditioned and our little plantation houses aren't, but not in our church. These moms and dads have their kids out working. 
Now, we're not talking sweatshops. We're talking in areas where that they're being mentored. They're getting paid. They're having to get up at a certain time. They have to stay on the job. They have to do a good job. They're being evaluated. At the end of all of that, they're getting paid. They're being taught how to take the money that they've earned, use it wisely, give it, save it, manage it, all of that. They're being taught. Not one family. Multiple families are doing this. I'm going to tell you that there's a generation that is now live, living and being groomed according to this passage of Scripture. And should I live that long and Jesus doesn't come back, I'm going to watch these young people as sharp as they are now. These are going to be the superstar champions in the future. Whether they are going to be ditch diggers, candlestick makers, or bakers, it doesn't matter. They are going to have the work ethic and they can help but succeed. And I pray that we would have that work ethic that was so found in the Judeo-Christian ethic. Number four, the right to a God-centered education a right to a God-centered education. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. Jehovah is our God. Jehovah, the Savior, is our God. The Jehovah is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the New Testament even adds the word mind. These words which I am commanding you today, which are found in the Old Testament and now the New Testament too, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction and other versions say the nurturing of the Lord because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And our forefathers fully understood that. So much so that if you go back to the founding educational institutions of America and found out what they were like. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Dartmouth. Dartmouth was basically started actually by a a, a little pastor over here, missionary pastor, who wanted to help reach Indians for Christ. So he then brought in Indians and trained them to go do that. That was Dartmouth. You go all the way back to Harvard. Harvard had a student handbook. Their student handbook wasn't so nicely called student handbook. Theirs was called Rules and Precepts. And in it, it said this, quote, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And on the original seal of Harvard, it says this, truth for Christ in the church. So I'm not saying that every school has got to be a Bible college or a seminary. What I am saying is, That we ought not to put a lid on the freedom that we have to be able to teach our children and others the Word of God. And that when they go to a school, that that school gives equal time to those who are Christians and the freedom to be able to have Bible studies in the school just as they would any other group that wants to worship any other thing, whether it's money or science. They should still have the freedom to do that. That God should not be denigrated even if they want to teach someone else. He can go that far. So if you can't be fully on God, at least don't be anti-God in the country that we have. And if you really want to know, cut my wrist. Don't cut my wrist, but if I could, I would bleed. (laughs) I would bleed that that school would be a God-honoring, Christ-centered school so that the next generation would be raised up on these biblical Judeo-Christian ethics. So I'm telling you, it's a very important ethic to have, the right to a God-centered education and not to be us um, squelched with that. Number five, the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. Now, some people, when they read that, they think, ooh, we've got to honor the Jews and, and, and pour more money into Israel and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm not uh, trying to uh, make light of all of that, but I think we always, we think levelly, oh, the Jews are so important, they're our friends, and they're the only bastion of somewhat democracy in the Middle East. I get all of that, and I celebrate all of that, and I stand with them politically with all of that, and maybe a little bit militarily with all of that. I get, I get that because of all that anti-God that's out there. But really, the basis of the Abrahamic covenant is much deeper and more important than that. So listen very carefully. God took a Gentile like he would an Arab, took a Gentile and he says, now this Gentile right here is now going to have a new nation come out of his loins with his wife through a promise, a place, and a people group. And he said, and out of this group, all the nations of the world would be blessed eternally because out of this people group is going to come the only Savior, Jesus Christ. But also with this nation, I've got to give them a place to live. So they're going to have this place over here. This nation over here has got to be large enough so that it'll keep on sustaining it. This nation has got to have a set of rules and rights and, and all the kinds of regulations which will be found in Scripture. This nation is going to be the one that from him will come Jesus Christ, the Lord, who will be the Savior of all the world. So that nation is important. But also, don't leave this out. 
It's through this nation that I'm going to be showing the rest of the world that if you follow me with all of your heart, soul, and mind, then I will bless that nation. And so all the rest of you, even though you are not that nation, if you will just follow the God of Jesus Christ, you then will be blessed. And he looked at all of that. And those nations, we're not a Jewish nation. We're just a nation of a bunch of ragamuffin people who left another country or a bunch of pioneers and wound up on one side of our country and slowly, methodically, but with a lot of hard work and pioneer spirit, we walked across this country. But we walked across it for the most part with a heart turned toward the Lord. And I know there's a lot of those old Western things out in Tombstone, Arizona, a bunch of wicked people. But let's remember that there are a lot of God-fearing people that really stood for the Lord. And I think you'll agree with that. So again, the Abrahamic covenant is to then see where that came from. And then it goes back to Israel. And whoever honors Israel will be blessed. And so I do honor Israel and we should. And we have missionaries that are reaching Jewish people and those that are uh, rabbis and others. So it is important. But let's just remember that Americans have accepted as fact that good deeds produced by good results. And that happens when we are God-fearing and we respect these people. Let me go to number six. These will go more quickly and we'll be done. Common decency. Common decency. Simply put, decent nations are made up of decent people who, when faced with situations, would do the decent and honest things. For example, Americans have given their lives on foreign shores to protect those who um, were dying, who were being slaughtered. And we did that because we just care for them. When I think of um, the Statue of Liberty, most of you know it, but do you remember what it says? These words are engraved there at a plaque. It says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And so we're basically saying we came to this country as immigrants, and we tried to do what we can to make this a God-fearing country, We are God-fearing. You have a need. We are decent people. We want you to come. But when you come, we also have, watch this, God-fearing laws that are established here. There's a God-fearing way that we can best take care of you, and they're according to our proper laws. Now, when we begin to convolute all of this stuff, and we got all these kinds of problems, we begin to change the rules and all of this, then we have the problems that we have. So having that open heart is not wrong, but having now the biblical basis of what we're going to do and how we're going to treat those that are coming in, We've got to follow what Scripture has to say. That's the Judeo-Christian ethic. And why is that? Because of common decency. Take, take this one step further. If we really care for the person, then we want to make sure they're properly cared for the best way we possibly can. And if we are absolutely overwhelmed by our ability to be able to do that, can you imagine how we're really not taking care of them? We are giving them, watch this, false sense of hope. So then they come in, they amalgamate what we're doing, and pretty soon, watch this, watch this, Just like the children of Israel, when the other nations came in, they began to pollute that system of Judaism. And all of a sudden, then Israel became weak and they couldn't help anybody. And you had a mess. Enough said. The last one is this. Our personal accountability to God. That's uh, the foundation of all of these. And that is the Judeo-Christian ethics says we believe there is a God and we are accountable to him from the inside out. We know it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after that comes his judgment, and the judgment comes before the Lord. Daniel Webster, a great American statesman, said this, What is the most sobering thought that ever entered your mind? He quickly responded, Most sobering thought that ever entered his mind. It was this. Simple. My personal accountability to God. We're not a special people because we're great. If we're any special It's because God is great, and at one time in our history, we have honored him, and we tried to set forth a set of laws to not make us a religious country, but a God-fearing country. And as long as we stay close to that, and I'm sorry that we've drifted, we're not going to be that strong any longer. And so now, what can we do? What can we do? And I want to close with this. The greatest thing we can do, first of all, is to place our faith alone in Jesus Christ. We need to have our personal freedom, ourself, before all of this other stuff. Even if I'm in a country that has all the laws that are against God, I myself can still have freedom in my soul because I have the freedom from sin. That means no longer does sin have dominion over me. doesn't mean I don't sin any longer, but it doesn't have that controlling factor and damning factor over me. I'm freed from sin. 
but I'm also freed from death. So no matter what you do, chop my head off, take away everything that I have. I starve to death. It doesn't really matter. Torture me. I still, my body will die, but the real me will live forever. And that freedom only comes when I place my faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And I come to Him as a sinner in need of a Savior, knowing that because I've sinned, I'm separated from Him by my nature and choice. And all I can do now is to come to Him realizing that no good deed I could ever do could ever give me eternal life. All of that is God's grace. All of that is His mercy. All of that is His forgiveness. All of that is His sovereignty. And He is raining down that freedom on us if we would simply come to Him, Jesus Christ and Him alone. That's the whole key. So I need to trust Christ right off the bat from the very beginning. But there's other things that I can do too. So if you will, write these down. And then take these to your family. They're just like two words. That might be a blessing to you as it was to me. Let me get these two words out for you. Here it is. Number one. Here it is. You ready? Here it is. Trust Christ. Number two. Suffer joyfully. God says that we will suffer in the last days. Things are going to get worse and worse. So let's suffer but joy with inside of us because we know that no present suffering that we have today will ever compare to the eternal joy that we'll have forever in heaven. So suffer joyfully. Uh, Number three. Hope cheerfully. We do have another home in heaven. This is not our home. We're just passing through. Number four, wait patiently. Wait patiently. The Lord is coming. I've already read to you Psalm 11. He will judge the wicked, and we will see the face if we are righteous of our own Savior. And number five, pray earnestly. I pray earnestly, and while we're praying for our president and some of the things that he says and does, I get all of that, but I think we've learned one lesson more than ever. We need to pray more for our Supreme Court judges. Number five, believe confidently. I take refuge in the Lord because he is large and in charge, and he is my Lord. He is my king. He is my judge. He is my ever and ever forever savior. And so no matter what I go through in this world, it's okay. I'm going to follow the book right here. This is my declaration of independence, God's word. This is my bill of rights, the word of God. This is my constitution, God's word right here. And so I follow it. And then I need to triumph finally. Not now, but finally. We will triumph, folks. And I pray that you'll trust Christ. Let me end with a little humorous but yet important thought, and that's simply this. Don't leave here today and say, our pastor's running for office. (laughs) I am not looking for votes. I am not running for office. I don't want any of that. Um, I'd rather come alongside those that are affected by those who are in office and love on you and together discover Scripture and to remind each other it's in His presence that our real joy and security is found. Let's pray, shall we? I love God's Word. I'm so grateful for it. I'm so grateful for the Spirit of God that will help me to understand His Word because frankly, sometimes it can be complicating. But at the same time, as I abide in His Word and depend on His Spirit and deal with the sins that are in my life as a Christian now, His Word comes alive and I can see sometimes more deeply and wider through all of this. And I can see that God has so much for us that we can help those starting with our families and and then moving into our church and then moving out into our community, into our state and our country and the Mid and South Pacific Island and then all the world. But it starts right here with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So maybe right now you'd like to say to the Lord, you know, I heard a lot today about the foundations of my freedom, but I really want to be free in Christ because it says the truth shall make me free. And I heard today that Jesus is the way and the truth for me to be eternally free. And so since He is the source of all of that and I can only be free in Christ, then I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. And while our country may pump out more laws and can find more Christianity than ever before and release and legalize more sin than ever before, I will always be free in Christ. Apart from that, my friend, you not only are not free if you're not in Christ, you're more enslaved now than you were a year ago. And sin does have dominion over you. And you have a horrible place to look forward to when you die. And God says that he loves you so much he doesn't want you to go there. And that's why Christians can say, in his presence, I have this joy because they've trusted Christ. Maybe you're ready to do that. 
right now in your own heart, will you believe that Jesus Christ loved you and that he said to you, he that believes on me has everlasting life and that it's not by works of righteousness which you've done? Nah, it's his mercy that saves you. And so you're taking his mercy now by trusting in Christ. You might say, Lord, I know I've done things wrong, but the best in know how, I'm trusting you. Now, praying won't get you to heaven, but it's that mental transaction of you placing your faith in Christ. Do it right now. Do it right now. Don't wait another moment. Walk out of here a free man, a free woman, a free guy, a free gal in Christ. All right? If you're doing that, I'd like to pray for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to have you say anything or stand up. I'm not going to do anything that will cause you to not realize that it's by faith in Christ alone. So when I have you slip up your hand, it's only because you've already trusted Christ in your mind, in your heart, right where you're seated. You placed your faith in him. And by raising your hand, you're just going to do it up and down, boop, boop, just like that. And I'm just going to say thank you or I see that hand or God bless you. Something just simple so you know I saw it. And then I'm going to pray for you. Now when I do, I won't mention your name in my prayer. I won't describe you in my prayer. But I will welcome you into God's family. And they'll let you know that you are not alone. That you are in a community of the redeemed. A mighty community of people who think like you and love you and are on a journey of knowing more about the Lord. A group of people who will see the face of the Lord, who live righteously, not to be saved, not to stay saved, but because they are forgiven. They do it as a way to say thank you. So is there anyone in here that's today is the day that you're going to trust Christ as your Savior? You're ready to do that right now. If that's the case, and you're trusting Him in your heart, you're saying, Lord, the best in a how, I'm trusting in you. It's that mental transaction, calling upon the Lord, that faith in Him and Him alone thing. It's happening inside. You're doing it right now. And you'd like for me to pray for you. Would you slip up your hand? Put it up, put it down real quick so I can see it right now. Never done it before. You're doing it now. Put it up, put it down. All right, dearly beloved ones, take the time and go over these seven ethics. And then ask yourself, are you embracing these ethics? Are you teaching them to your kids? Are you letting those that you're discipling know that out of these ethics comes our life as a Christian and our life as a nation that's built upon a Judeo-Christian ethic, not just Old Testament law, not just New Testament principles, but it's based upon the never-changing Word of God and that our nation will be blessed when when God is our Lord, our Savior, and that in that, We are decent people working with those who don't know Christ and that we will help them to know the Lord. And I know there's the argument of, are we a Christian nation or not? Well, I know one thing. Our Constitution was built upon a biblical foundation. And you do the math. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the men and the women centuries ago that were willing to come together with documents upon which we could agree at the founding of our country. And then from those documents, we could enjoy the freedom that we have because in those documents, we would find all that that would speak to righteousness. And so, Father, we know that in many ways perhaps in our desire to help mankind, our own countrymen, do better things, we made those decisions apart from seeking your counsel and your word first, and so we've messed it up. And so, Lord, help us, Father, if we can't um, fix our foundations here of our country, at least as righteous people, what we can do is we can trust in you as our Savior. We can still joyfully suffer. We can still cheerfully have hope. We we can still earnestly pray. We can also victoriously know that in eternity that we will celebrate our life with you. And so, Lord, help us now to embrace that, to let our voice, our vote, and our very lifestyle be this. 
Father, we pray this in your precious name. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Oh, 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 oh,